So today I'll be going over custom interfaces for ZBrush. Um, so typically this is the kind of interface you'll see when you load up ZBrush. Uh, if you want to access your brushes you'll have to go through the option at the top left uh, and click through the brushes manually or use the shortcuts on your keyboard to quick select them. And the same with any of your most commonly used items if you want to access them such as the merge item or anything under the geometry panel you'll need to go through several different levels of uh, layers in order to get there. So what you can do is if I just load up my custom UI, you can see that I've customized it. So you can, uh, so my materials are at the bottom. Uh, not only that, but my most commonly used brushes are at the bottom as well. And same with my masking and clipping features. This just allows me to access them very, very quickly uh, without having to go through several different menus. And it's the same with my uh, most commonly used features in, in the menu, such as the tool menu or the brush menu. What I do is instead of having them um, separated and individually laid out on my front interface, I will just create a drop down menu instead and have them placed in there. So you can see I can quickly do things like Z remesh my uh, my topology without having to go through the uh, subtool Z remesher, well, the geometry Z remesher options. Now what you can do is, if you go into preferences, config and enable customize, you can start to move elements of your interface around by holding control, alt and uh, left click dragging from one place to another. This very quickly allows you to move elements of the interface around and remove and remove it, uh, elements of the interface as well if you don't need them. In this case, I've just I've accidentally removed uh, my main material node, so I will try and get that back, which should be fairly straightforward if I could just do that through the material drop down at the top. You just need to make sure that you dock it to the side before you start dragging elements around. So as you can see, I'm just quickly going through and uh, dragging random brushes down to my interface palette. And what I'm doing is I'm just going to show you how you can quickly move custom UI elements around to create drop down menus. So for now I'll just create a temporary menu and you can see it's popped up at the top but there should be nothing in it. So in the same way that I do with everything else on the interface, I will use Control Alt and left click to drag the menu down to my palette, my menus palette. So what I've done there is I've just added a sub menu 
to my drop down menu so I can quickly split up elements into collective groups. It just makes for better organization overall. So as you can see here, I'm just moving elements into uh, the sub palette. And it should show up in my drop down on the left. I strongly recommend you set up custom menus on custom interface in general. It will just make your workflow much, much faster overall. Otherwise, you become hamstringed by having to go through several different menus to access something as simple as a brush or using the Dynamesh tool or Zed Remesher tools. And if you want to save it, you just go to Config and Save UI. And it should load up every time you restart ZBrush. So this is one of the tusks for the mammoth. Uh, this one is used uh, specifically for the war mammoth which is mounted. So you can see that there's a lot of detail sculpted in here. Um, a lot of these skulls that were placed in there. But not all of this was sculpted by hand. So what we do is we would start with a, a geometry something similar to this. And we would use a technique called insert mesh brush. Basically, this just allows you to place a pre-existing mesh onto the surface of, a, of another mesh of your selected mesh. As you can see here, the, uh, the skulls are actually sticking out from the surface. There's a bit of distance between the uh, center of the skull and the geometry. So what we want to do here is we want to adjust the embed distance which allows you to insert a mesh uh, based on a selected distance away from the underlying mesh. In this case, I've placed this option onto one of my custom menus. So now you can see it sits in the mesh nicely. And you can place as many of these as you like, or until you run out of memory on your computer. So for this example, um, I'll just do a couple of schools rather than trying to populate the whole mesh. And you can see here that the insert mesh geometry uses different polygroups to the underlying mesh. So each head has its own set of polygroups. This allows you to easily split up the mesh uh, and se select different elements of it. So what I've done there is I split these scores off into their own subtool. This is so I could start sculpting the underlying geometry. Basically, I just want the underlying geometry to conform better to the shape of the scores. The reason why I do this is because it's going to make it a lot easier to sculpt later on.
as you can see here, I'm just trying to cap some of the mouths of the skulls. The reason being is that for the next process, which we'll go through, um, it uh, makes the generation of a new mash much easier. Otherwise, you end up with tons of holes and uh, holes and gaps in the mesh where you are not desirable. Cool. So once that's done, I merge the geometry together because what I'm going to do now is use the technique called Dynamesh. And what that will do is that will take my school meshes and my underlying cylindrical mesh and it will convert it all into just one big mesh. So it's all one contiguous mesh at that point and I can sculpt over the whole thing without having to worry about uh, the geometry underneath being separate. At this point, I'm just tweaking the resolution just to make sure that it works, that it works at a level that I want. So at something like 1 to 8, in this case, it's uh, not giving me the resolution that I need. So I'll pump it up to about 2000. And, then, and that, that seems to work much better. So you can see now that the meshes are joined together. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sculpting in those sinewy elements that you can see on the original mesh. Basically making it look as though it's uh, flesh that, that has been stretched over the skulls but also merged into them. Now, if I'd have tried to do this before, uh, you would have seen a gap between both the skull and the underlying mesh um, because there would have been two separate meshes. Uh, Zebrush wouldn't have known that they would need to be sculpted together almost in an organic, fleshy way. And so it just would have, it just would have created a gap between both the skulls and the mesh underneath. To get most of these effects, I usually use a combination of um, the standard brush and the clay build-up brush. The standard brush gives it a, a relatively good amount of height, and the clay build-up does a great job of blending uh, different heights together, so you can get a bit more of an even surface. And I'll pretty much repeat that process in the cavities and the cracks just to make it all work and all fit together. 
and at this point I'm just using the trim dynamic brush just to get a bit of a wear and tear in the original schools. I'll normally combine this with a, a couple of custom alphas just to make it look as though it's uh, had some dents and some scratches over time. And here's what the finished one looked like. So you can see in this case I used two different types of skulls rather than the one. Just to get that mixture of both human skulls and almost demonic skulls too. And then to finish it off I'll just take the Damien Sander brush and uh, just refine some of those edges, specifically around the teeth, just so I get a nicer bake for my low poly. So now I'm going to go through detailing a high poly uh, metal mesh, specifically detailing things such as armour and hard surface elements. So you can see here, here's the uh, clean high poly mesh. Uh, no sculpting has been done in it yet. This was basically built in 3D Studio Max. And what I tend to do is... Um, I will take it from Max and I will take it straight into ZBrush and I will use a technique uh, called Z Remesher Projection. Basically I will take the original geometry, I will use Z Remesher on it and then I will project the curvature of the Max Mesh onto it and what that does is that gives me a nice clean mesh to sculpt on. So right now I'm just trying to find a nice target polygon count for my new mesh. This just takes a bit of time as Zebrush is just thinking about where to put the topology. So you can see from the wireframe that the topology looks quite different from the original. It doesn't have that same curved surface, but right now we're not going for that. We're just trying to find, we're just trying to get the approximate proportions and the approximate silhou uh, silhouette. Because what we'll do is we'll take that mesh and we'll project it over. I realise I didn't turn symmetry on, so I'm just z remeshing it again. And I wanted to add a bit more definition too, so I, I bumped up the target polygon count to 10k. So what I'm doing now is I'm just going to start projecting the mesh over at different subdivision levels. So basically I will use Z project and I will project the original mesh over from max onto my new mesh subdivide the new mesh and then do the same thing again. So I have a shortcut set for the uh, projection settings but you can find this in the geometry panel, uh, sorry the subtool panel under project. I've used a custom interface for so long that I forgot where everything is on the original default interface. There we go. So you can see at the low subdivision, there's still it's still changed the mesh slightly. So I'm just going to subdivide it again, project it again, subdivide it one more time, and project it one more time. And you can see it's starting to look more and more like the mesh that was taken out of Max. <laughs> 
so you can hardly see the difference between them. So what I'll do now is I will, in order for the mesh to bake down nicely to my low poly mesh, you want to have some sort of curvature around a hard edge. Any kind of geometry, even in real life, it's never a, a full 90 degree curved a full 90 degree right angled surface. There's always some element of curvature, no, long, no matter how small. So what I'll do is I'll just relax the mesh and polish the mesh using the uh, deformation settings, which you can also find uh, in the geometry panel below. And it just gives the mesh uh, a nice bit of curvature. So before I start detailing, what I tend to think about is where elements are going to be symmetrical. In order to save texture space, I don't want every part of this mesh to be completely asymmetrical in terms of detail. So obviously from the front, you'll be able to see both sides of the mesh. You'll be able to see where I put large scratches and large elements of detail. But from the side, especially around the back, you're not going to notice that at all. So I'll tend to keep that symmetrical. I think the rule of thumb for anything on Warhammer is if you can't see both sides at the same time, we tend to make it symmetrical. It just saves texture resolution. So you can see what would happen if I made it too symmetrical at the front of the mesh. So at the front I will make it asymmetrical and at the back I will make it completely symmetrical. To start off with, before I start adding scratches and adding fine detail, what I'll do is I'll use brushes such as the Trim Dynamic, um, Clay, clay Buildup and the Hard Polish brushes and I will start to add kind of edge wear around the, around the edges of the armour just to make it look as though it's been chipped and worn away at the edges first. This is just a nice way to avoid having a completely uniform looking mesh. And just makes it look a bit more rougher, a bit more battered overall. So you can see it's starting to look a bit more rough. Even just that small amount of detail, it's just breaking up that even surface, those even edges. At this point I've just turned the symmetry on just to indicate what it's doing on both sides. And something I didn't mention is the use of layers. So what you can do is you can use layers to quickly make your mesh non-destructible. So what you can do with the layers is you can turn them on and off, you can change the opacity of a layer, um, control how much wear and tear is on a layer, uh, and then just turn the opacity up and down just to, to get that extra additional bit of control. Otherwise, if you start sculpting directly onto the surface of the geometry and you don't like it, you only have a certain number of undo steps before you kind of run out of memory. Basically, think of it the same way you, as you'd think of layers in Photoshop. You're just adding more control to the mesh or more control to your workflow. 
and in order to speed things up what I'll do is I'll turn solo mode on so it hides everything else in the scene and just speeds up the the interface a bit if you've got too many meshes displayed in your scene it will slow down your it will slow down your um, your workspace very quickly So again, just continue with this until you're happy with the look. Obviously, you won't, you, you don't need to go around every single edge, but for it's nice to just kind of get a bit of diversity in there. Some edges can be a bit cleaner, a bit smoother, and the, the rest of them just run over it with the trim dynamic. And here I've just zoomed in a little bit because it, it doesn't always work from a distance if your brush is too big and you've got a very acute angled edge. Sometimes you can have a bit of trouble picking it up, so you just zoom in, shrink your brush size down, and you should be fine. Cool. and there you go you can see the difference with it on and without it on just gives it a nice bit of um, a nice bit of erosion a nice bit of noise around those edges So you can see there, those brushes aren't actually part of the ZBrush interface. Um, what I've done is I've created those brushes using custom alphas uh, and then changed the settings. So using drag rect and uh, brush spray settings in the stroke just to kind of um, create customizable uh, wear and tear brushes to quickly apply detail to the armor. So what I'm doing at this point is using this as a base for larger scratches. So I'll do some tests with this drag rex brush and it basically just saves time. I don't have to sit here and try and get each individual scratch into the into the armor by hand. It's, I can just use a brush and drag the details onto it. And again, taking into account symmetry, uh, you know, the front of the, the helmet can be seen on both sides. So I, I don't want a ton of obvious symmetry there. I want to make sure that I keep that towards the back. I'll also try and get some of those, uh, some of those scratches to hit the edge of the metal, the edge of the armor. If you think of impact points and think of pressure in general, uh, you're going to get the most impact on the edge of armor just because the pressure there is the most intense due to the smaller surface area. On some of the flatter surfaces and thicker surfaces you won't get as much impact on the armor, you'll just get smaller dents. Cool, so now what I'm going to do is uh, exaggerate and elaborate on some of those existing scratches that the dense brush would have done using the Damien standard brush. Seeing as though they're already there, uh, I might as well use those as a base and just accentuate those, those dents even further, adding a couple of additional ones to the corners. <laughs> 
again, it's not important what brush you use for these. Uh, you can find custom brushes that do a really good job of cracks uh, and scratches, but I tend to just use the default Damien standard or slash brushes. You can get some of this detail using your texturing tools, whether you use the Quixel Suite or whether you use Substance. But for some of the bigger scratches, uh, it makes more sense to just sculpt them in. You'll just get a much nicer, um, much nicer texture and much nicer texture fidelity overall. You tend to use things like Substance and, and Quixel for smaller, more tiling scratches. Things that are more superficial on the surface. Whereas for big, chunky scratches, you still want to make sure you, you kind of sculpt them in. So just continuing with this until I find a, uh, I find a nice detail level overall. Yeah, so one thing that I tend to see a lot is that when it comes to scratches over surfaces of different angles, uh, people tend to have the same scratch going over the entire surface. So it basically looks like a sword or, or some sort of weapon has penetrated the whole surface and doesn't take into account that that weapon will jump over, the, over a surface where the angle changes. So just something to consider. It's actually a bit of a pet hate of mine. Um, try and not try and take things like surface angle surface thickness into account when you add detail you know in something big and chunky like this you're not going to see huge massive chunks of metal missing it's going to be more superficial to show its protective quality So now I'm going to add a, well, you can see the difference first between the scratches on and off and the detail on and off. And, you know, you just at this point, just adding it up in layers. So at this point, what I'll do is I'll use a, a custom brush, two custom brushes, a noise brush and a potholes brush. And the goal of these is just literally, as the name suggests, just to add a bit of noise to the surface. Just so when you're baking the textures, when you're baking this down into textures, when you get your normal maps and your cavity maps and your curvature maps, you get a nice bit of variation in terms of surface noise. So when you apply materials onto it in um, in substance and in Quixel, they'll recognize that surface differentiation and uh, really give you some interesting texture detail. Again, this is we keep this quite subtle. We don't need to be overboard. There's got to be a balance between how much you do on the ZBrush model and how much you do in um, in your texturing tools. And the same with the pothole brushes. Uh, I tend to use something like this over areas where there's um, where there's a change in angle in the surface, or where you've got something sitting on top of a surface to show some sort of grunge or edge wear or cavity wear even. And it's just a simple case of dragging and dropping on. 
cool and you can see the difference there. Again, it's not it's not incredibly obvious, but it's more than enough for um, your baking tools to pick it up. All right, so finally, I'll use a insert multi mesh brush to start adding rivets to the surface. Uh, an insert multi mesh brush is basically a brush that consists of several meshes and it allows me to cycle through them. So in this case, I've got one called rivets uh, and different sizes of rivets, different types of rivets. And then what I can do is I can just drag them onto any surface that I want. Because they're a separate mesh to the, the underlying surface, it's not sculpting into the mesh, it's basically adding a new mesh onto the surface. Um, they're very easy to control and remove. So with skin, what I tend to do is I try and work at different levels. The goal is to start off with something that's uh, more primary in terms of defining the silhouette, uh, trying to define the major forms. And then what I'll do is I'll take it to a tertiary level, try and define the, the finer folds. It might not necessarily affect the silhouette, but uh, it will affect the detail level at a distance. And then I will sculpt the tertiary forms, so things like really fine wrinkles, uh, skin pores, mole spots, all that sort of thing. Stuff that won't affect the silhouette but will definitely affect the final texture. So one thing I just wanted to go through was the use of gravity on your brushes. So with the standard brush, uh, by default gravity com uh, is turned off. And what that does is when you are sculpting, it means that the geometry comes out perpendicular to the underlying mesh. So it just comes out in a straight angle, a straight line. Now, if you turn the gravity on, um, you can turn it quite high. I think in this case, I'll just ramp it up a little bit so you can see it better. You can see that it uh, the gravity also droops the mesh a little bit, makes it almost look like a sagging fold. It's a bit sore here, so what I'll do is I'll ramp the gravity up a little bit more so you can get a clearer view. And that's a bit too much. So you can see there that it's pushing the mesh down. And this is great for sagging folds, clothing folds, basically anything affected by gravity, which most of the time skin is. So at my lowest subdivision level, with the gravity on, I'll use my standard brush to start to define the forms. The goal is, again, just to get that overlying silhouette and make sure that it kind of, it changes the proportions and changes the way that the character looks over the surface whilst defining the major forms. Now, the dangerous part of this is, and one thing I want to stress is not to go into your subdivisions too early. You don't want to start subdividing the mesh uh, too early to the point where you are sculpting on it um, and trying to define major forms you're just going to get issues um, these forms are meant to be defined at a lower resolution if you try and define them too high uh, it causes all sorts of anomalies with the mesh and you don't really get the control that you would get at a lower level 
So think of it like building layers. You you basically you want to try and get all of your major uh, silhouette forms at a lower level, and then subdivide your mesh. Get your morph secondary form, subdivide your mesh again. Get your tertiary forms. And again, brushes like standard brush, uh, clay build-up brush, move brush, these are all great for doing this. Even the smooth brush as well, just to make sure that you can kind of get more control over the, over the curvature of the underlying surface. So right now I'm just defining major shapes on the character, notably around the eye. So now I'm just ready to take that mesh to the next level and start adding secondary detail. Smoothing out some of the primary detail that's there underneath. So you can see that my uh, top eyelid had some sort of pinching going on on the mesh. So I'll just use a brush such as the inflate brush to push some of those uh, vertices on that area out just so I've got a bit more room to play with it. And then start to use brushes like the Damien Standard Brush to define those uh, tight and sharp, uh, sharp lines. Again, you'll find yourself using a lot of these brushes in combination frequently. There's no right or wrong way to do this. It's entirely dependent on how you feel the most comfortable working and you will develop your own workflow over the process. The key thing here is reference. Just making sure you get the right reference for uh, things such as an elephant's eye in this case. Uh, look at the way skin sags. Obviously this is a fantasy character so its tusks are in a completely different place than you might find on a regular elephant. So making sure that we um, combine both real life and real world anatomy as well as, um, you know, using a bit of fantasy there as well, just mixing and matching, trying to make sense of it all. And here you can see here, this is kind of what I'm uh, finished with and at this point I would start to add tertiary forms so things like wrinkles pores all of that sort of detail so yeah so in this case I'm using the Damien Sander brush to get those sharp wrinkles in there And as you can see, they're not really affecting the silhouette of the geometry too much. It's mainly surface detail at this point. 
just to accentuate the uh, the wrinkles a bit more, I'll take the standard brush in and just make some of the fat in between those wrinkles pop out. Well, the, the skin, not the fat. Now what I'm going to start to look at is adding spots and pores to the character. So I'll turn the gravity down. And this is where I need to look at using an alpha. Basically I'm stamping that alpha at this point onto the character to give that effect. So I'm just running through what the different brushes, uh, what each of the different brush strokes do. And they basically take the alpha and apply it in different ways. Whether it be a straight line or whether it's a spray. The one I'll most commonly use for something like this would be drag wrecked. Basically, I'm just dragging out the alpha at this point over the surface. But I just need to make sure that I've got the right alpha for the job. And I think this one should be right. So yeah, you can just spray that on. And it's a very fast way to add detail and add uh, tertiary detail to the skin. And as you can see on the fine elephant, I haven't put that skin detail everywhere, as most of it's going to be covered with fur anyway, so I've just put it under the parts where you, you'll see the underlying skin. 